This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. We're very, very pleased to welcome Dr. James Crossland from, from Perth, and all the way from Australia. All the way from Australia. Tonight. Um, and he's going to be talking about, as, as you know, about the spine on the Red Cross during the Second World War, and in general, about humanitarian diplomacy, which is a concept that I've just made the acquaintance of, which sounds very interesting oh. to you. It's, uh, it's either the most fascinating thing in the world or the most dull. <laughs> it's, it's one of the two. I'm not entirely sure what which yet. Ho- hopefully, it's, it's uh, the latter. Um, uh, thank you for having me. Um, much of what I'm going to be talking about um, this evening is is drawn from a book I've just finished on uh, the relations between uh, Britain and the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, during the Second World War. Um, I wanted to focus on the ICRC as a political entity. Um, it's not to say that I don't sort of discuss the humanitarian work that the ICRC did, uh, but uh, what fascinates me about the ICRC is how um, it operates as a uh, humanitarian actor that is, uh, has no official diplomatic status, um, really has no, no real sway other than uh, what is laid down in um, uh, its statutes and in international humanitarian law, and yet it's able to uh, achieve so much in war um, in the face of uh, belligerents who often don't really uh, uh, appreciate what it's doing. And this was particularly the case when I looked into its relations with Britain in the Second World War. Um, there was an awful lot of trust, uh, or lack thereof, um, uh, in that particular relationship. And that's what I want to uh, focus on uh, this evening, that theme of, of a lack of trust. And Indeed, I want to expand on it by bringing in the lack of trust uh, shown to the ICRC by the United States government, its military, uh, and specifically its intelligence services, um, primarily in 1942-43 in the Mediterranean. Um, It was in these years that um, a new American Secret Service Agency, the precursor to the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, launched an investigation into uh, the Red Cross in Turkey, uh, Spain, North Africa, and Italy. In so doing, added to what was already a pretty tangible sense of suspicion that had been growing pretty much since the start of the war in Whitehall (laughs) towards the ICRC. Um, first, some background on why these Allied suspicions were so important, why, why I, I thought it was such a relevant thing to include in the book. <laughs> when looked at in the broader stretch of, of Red Cross history, um, since its inception in 1864, the ICRC has operated pretty much on the, on the idea that it maintains its prestige and credibility in the eyes of belligerents. If belligerents don't trust the ICRC, the ICRC cannot operate. Um, And so it's very important that it's able to, uh, then as now, to convince uh, belligerent states that its people in the field um, will remain neutral, impartial, will not meddle in military affairs, etc., etc. And this policy was actually cemented in 1930 uh, by Max Huber, the, uh, the uh, president of the ICRC, when he, he put down in writing that the, the quality, the primary quality of an ICRC delegate is that they remain neutral at all times. Now, with the exception of Japan and the Soviet Union, neither of whom recognised the right of the ICRC to carry out its work um, in uh, the Far East and on the Eastern Front, the belligerents of the Second World War, Germany included, in the main recognised the neutrality of the ICRC uh, and actually uh, went along with it, um, which in itself I think is quite extraordinary given the totality of that conflict. Beneath this acceptance of the ICRC as an institution, however, Um, The Germans, the French, the British and the Americans, to varying extents, suspected individual ICRC delegates on the ground uh, at different times. I believe they could not be trusted. Now, the reasons for this impression uh, were many and varied. Um, For some British officials, it was formed simply from the fact that the committee's delegates were these um, unarmed, Uh, civilian representatives of a non-belligerent private organisation operating in enemy territory. How could you possibly trust them? Um, And this was exacerbated in particular uh, quite early in the war, in fact, just after the fall of France, when uh, the ICRC uh, 
managed to convince the, the British government to let them send relief supplies to, to Vichy. Um, and those supplies were promptly requisitioned and sent to the Reich. Um, to which the, the British turned around and said, well, well, why did you let them take? Why did you let our enemies take this, 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 this aid? Um, now, most officials, and I will stress this, most officials in Whitehall understood that this was a necessary condition of the ICRC's work. It was just something that was going to happen. Few had genuine suspicion that what was going on there was that they actually wanted to send material to the Reich. The one glaring exception to this otherwise reasonable view of the ICRC's work in Whitehall was to be found in the Ministry of Economic Warfare, which is the department tasked with enforcing the blockade of the Third Reich. Um, the prevention of sending food and medical supplies and other mat war material into uh, Hitler a territory uh, that was in, under Hitler's control. After the fall of France, uh, the blockade strategy became absolutely essential to, to uh, Britain's uh, long-term plan to hold on until the United States came into the war. Um, combined with bombing and blockade, that was basically the, all they had all they had to, to use against Germany uh, because the, the British Expeditionary Force had been evacuated. Um, and so the, the blockade was very sensitive for, for the British. It was seen as a key strategic aspect of what they were doing. Um, and the Ministry of Economic Warfare really took to its task with gusto in late 1940, uh, tightened the blockade and became hypersensitive to any idea of any relief, particularly after the aforementioned Vichy debacle of, of, of uh, relief being sent to the occupied territories. Now, this necessarily brought it into conflict with the ICRC, who just as doggedly, just as dogmatically said, well, well, there's people who don't have food. They need food. We should be sending them food to which the ministry said, well, you can't send them food. And this was really, it really didn't get much more complex than that. It was that base, an argument. Um, we think this is the right thing to do. No, we think this is the right thing to do. And back and back and forth they went. Um, so it's fair to say that the Ministry of Economic Warfare, in particular, it's, it's quite hardline chief, Hugh Dalton, did not like the ICRC very much. Um, and the MEW was not beyond acting on its suspicions, um, which came gradually, Without real evidence other than the Vichy episode, it developed, this animosity developed into a, a lingering suspicion that perhaps there was something amiss with, the, with this Red Cross. When concessions similar to the ones granted to Vichy were granted to Greece uh, against the Ministry of Economic Warfare's uh, wishes in late 1941, the ICRC set up a relief uh, effort there, um, MEW immediately requested British intelligence to, and I quote, look into any Red Cross correspondence which throws any light on the International Red Cross being used by the enemy for exploitation of neutrals as intermediaries for the passing of information, particularly in connection with shipping intelligence in Greece. Now, in addition to concerns over the passing of intelligence, there were also rumours going around the ministry that a scam was being run by the ICRC's delegation in, uh, in Athens, whereby uh, funds taken from private donors in the United States were being used to buy food supplies that they would then sell off on the black market for a profit. Um, there's no evidence of that, but that was the rumour doing the rounds. Um, at the very least, there was a, a suspicion that the ICRC was not playing by the rules set down by the British authorities and was getting hold of food supplies from outside of the blockade, and thus, in the eyes of the Ministry of Economic Warfare, jeopardising Britain's wartime strategy. Now, the British, I should note, were not unique among the belligerents in suspecting uh, that the ICRC delegates could abuse their, their freedom of movement granted by their neutrality to act in a partial fashion. Um, the famous delegate, uh, some might say the archetypal ICRC delegate, Marcel Junot, he uh, was detained by the Gestapo um, in, in 1940 um, after he had a conversation with some uh, French officers who were interned. Um, the, the Gestapo thought that he was passing on intelligence from them to the uh, Free French in, in, in London, um, which uh, I sincerely doubt he was doing, but nonetheless he was detained and interrogated because of that. Japanese suspicions of IC, the ICRC uh, delegates in the Far East were even more serious, had even greater consequences. Uh, Hans Schweizer, who was a um, uh, 
self-appointed ICRC delegate in Singapore. He was uh, detained by the Kempatai, the, the Japanese secret police, on multiple occasions, and on one occasion he may well have been tortured. It's not entirely clear. Um, but this was after um, the British Special Operations Executive blew up uh, several ships in, in Singapore Harbour in 1943. Uh, and the Japanese were convinced that he had uh, collaborated with SOE to, to make this happen. Amazingly, he, he lived through through uh, Japanese-occupied Singapore, quite an achievement in itself. And the same was not true for two other delegates in Borneo, Matthias and Betty Fisher, who were both uh, beheaded uh, by the Japanese on suspicion that they were uh, leading a POW uh, coup uh, on, on in, in Borneo. Now, although no ICRC delegates were subject by the British or Americans to anything comparable to the aforementioned, that same basic concern over how these humanitarians could be trusted to remain neutral in these quite extreme environments, um, and, and the extent also to which that neutrality might be attractive to the enemy for infiltrating agents behind the lines, that led to similar suspicions of ICRC involvement in espionage. Now, to move to the OSS investigation, in 1942, the committee opened a number of delegations across Africa uh, and the Far East in response to the, to the spread of the war and the, the bringing in of Japan and, and the United States into the war. Um, as a response to the ICRC's expansion, uh, its, its humanitarian effort truly going global, the British not only instituted tougher censorship of the committee's mail, uh, almost everything was, was read at this point, not everything, but almost everything, uh, the committee could still send things through the Swiss diplomatic bag. Um, but they also laid down a requirement that all new delegates had to be screened by British intelligence before they could be given permission to go off to the, these often quite far-flung places, uh, Madagascar, Sri Lanka, and places like that. Um, delegates had actually been screened since 1940. By, by MI5, but to be honest, the, the early screenings were quite perfunctory, they didn't really go into great depth, but here um, MI5 really uh, uh, tightened up these measures, or at least ostensibly. Moreover, these screening measures were not entirely unjustified. The ICRC had to recruit Swiss citizens who wanted uh, to do the work, which required a certain amount of bravery, uh, required a certain amount of faith in the humanitarian ideal that underpinned the ICRC, and more importantly, they had to be in these areas. So the talent pool, if you like, was rather rather shallow, and as a result, some rather unsavory characters crept in. Um, the proposed delegate in Macau, for example, he was rejected by MI5 when it was found that he was on a, a British suspect list that had been drawn up in the 1930s of politically unreliable figures in the Far East who had expressed uh, pro-Japanese sympathies. Similar suspicions were raised over a delegate appointed to Diego Suarez in uh, 1942. He was permitted by the British to take up his post, albeit with the requirement that he be put under surveillance because he had... Uh, it had been tipped off by an MI6 station in Zurich that after the fall of France, he had basically gone around um, uh, with very little discretion saying, oh, isn't, isn't this wonderful, the new, the new order's coming, we're going to have a, a Hitlerite Europe, splendid. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that this chap had changed his tune. So they kept him under surveillance. And my, my suspicion is, and uh, there's no paper trail to this, but my suspicion is that they were probably going to see whether or not he was connected to a cell in the region and we're going to see if they could catch a bigger fish. I don't think they did because the paper trail kind of runs out on him. Hans Bonn, who was a hotelier from Basel, who volunteered for the ICRC's Cairo delegation in 1942, he was found by MI5 to be the most vehemently pro-Nazi in a family that had both a history of allegiance to National Socialism dating right back to the 1920s and current business ties to companies that were funding the German war effort. Interestingly enough, he actually passed his first screening. Uh, MI5 gave him a clean bill of health first time round, and it was only a year later that they realised he was a Nazi. Um, so MI5, were not, MI5 screening was not a precise science, but they did catch a couple of, of dubious characters. The uncovering of Hans Bonn came at a, a, a pretty awkward time. It touched a sensitive nerve, not only for the British, but also for the Americans whose strategic focus on North Africa, first as a target for invasion in 1942 in the Operation Torch landings, and then in 1943 as a base from which to attack uh, Italy and Sicily, considerably raised suspicions in the Allied camp that there were spies in the region. Um, in addition to the introduction by British intelligence of new screening measures, again, and even tighter screening measures after the fiasco with Bonn, um, 
the American commanders in North Africa sent out directives to their soldiers saying, and I quote, the ICRC should be treated with considerable circumspection as they are not considered to be reliable from a United Nations point of view. Now, Red Cross correspondence sent from Cairo and Algiers to Geneva uh, was also all, all read at this point. It was all decrypted and read. Um, and instructions were issued to all Allied troops to confine any conversation with ICRC delegates to Red Cross matters only because, and I quote, the whole of North Africa is infested with Axis spies. That's an AFHQ report. So it's fair to say that there is a, a spy scare going on in North Africa in 1943. And these long-standing suspicions of the ICRC come to the fore as a consequence. Now, initially, I thought, well, it's just that they'd had this drama with Hans Bonn and, and they, they were sort of moving on from that. But then I thought about it a bit more and remembered a few things I'd read about way back when and went and reread them and realised that there was actually a pattern here which, which predated the Second World War, a pattern of humanitarian action um, coming together with espionage work in a way that many in British in British intelligence circles seem to have remembered or at least thought um, uh, had, um, had some recollection of. During the 1920s, British intelligence uncovered a small spy ring in Switzerland uh, whose leader, uh, Sergei Batosky, was revealed to be a Russian agent. Um, he had uh, joined the uh, newly established Soviet Red Cross, which, as you can imagine, fell under uh, suspicion in the West, um, and, and, and set up his delegation in Switzerland. And it was basically a spy, a spy ring that he set up. Um, and that was quickly, quickly shut down. Um, the Americans also had some experience of humanitarians as spies after the First World War, some I'm sure you uh, no doubt are well aware, uh, Herbert Hoover's uh, relief program. Um, that was used by uh, the fledgling American intelligence community, which was quite disparate at that time different agencies um, they infiltrated agents under the cover of humanitarians into that into that program uh, to gather political uh, intelligence in Central Europe um, the American Red Cross uh, delegation in um, uh, Russia in, in Moscow specifically during the civil war there in the early 1920s uh, that too w was connected to a British intelligence operation the so-called Lockhart plot um, which was a, a plot to uh, um, overthrow the new the new Bolshevik government. Um, the America, it's not clear what their involvement was, but they knew about it. Uh, by all by all accounts, they seem to have known about it, and certainly, perhaps even uh, assisted in some ways. Finally, David Bruce uh, became a member of the OSS in 1941. He began the war as the head of the American Red Cross in Britain. He started the war as a humanitarian and he ended it as an intelligence agent. Um, so the idea that the Red Cross could be involved in espionage or could have some sort of interplay there was far from extraordinary to the minds of OSS, who duly launched uh, an investigation in 1942 into possible links between the ICRC and Berlin in the Mediterranean. The report that was eventually compiled by OSS in February 1944 named 49 ICRC workers suspected of such links to the Reich, of whom 21 were identified as being not simply volunteers, so not people who were recruited to just unpack parcels or drive trucks, uh, but official accredited delegates from Geneva. 21 were identified. In addition to accusations of passing intelligence on Allied troop movements, uh, and transporting German uh, spies into North Africa on board Red Cross marked ships. One delegate based in Turkey, a fellow called Giuseppe Beretta, was found to have received gold stolen from Hungarian Jews. Now, Beretta's treasure was actually discovered by the ICRC at the same time this investigation was going on. They, they, they were on to him as well. Uh, and his dismissal was ordered from the committee in February 1945. Um, Though highly inappropriate, obviously, Beretta's crime appears to have been one of self-interest pursued under the cover of Red Cross neutrality. It doesn't, to me, there's no connection to any sort of general corruption or, or pro-axis activity within the ICRC. Beretta seems to have been a lone wolf. Jean Pagan, who is a delegate in Algeria, he was arrested in October 1943 by the French military, found guilty of running a spy ring. He's a more serious case. Um, 
Before his eventual execution by firing squad in December 1944, Pagan claimed under interrogation to have recruited another ICRC delegate, uh, Georges Graz, and passed information to uh, contacts within the German embassy in Bern. Um, Graz was himself detained soon after Pagan's denouncement and brought in for questioning. He was, however, released with no charge by the French on the 18th of October. And there's a hint, and only a hint, um, in the British files on this that he may have been released because he was actually a double agent. But it's only a hint, so I wouldn't... Uh, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, as I say, the, 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 there's, there's only just the, the slightest thing. There's no real paper trail to that. Now, in regards to this OSS report, what's important to understand is when, when looking at the ICRC's reaction to this OSS report is the timing of its release. Um, it was declassified um, in the early 1990s, um, and this came off... The, the early 1990s was pretty much the worst time ever for the ICRC because uh, only a few years prior to that, uh, many eyebrows had been raised um, once again in the way they were immediately after the war over the ICRC's um, lack of action uh, over, the, over the Holocaust. Um, and this was because of a book written by Jean-Claude Favet, um, which uh, was a, who had access to the ICRC's files and basically uh, pointed out that they had failed and, and were arguably complicit to an extent in, in certain uh, aspects of the Holocaust. So it's very, and it's still controversial, still a sore topic in Geneva to this day. Um, so off the back of that, you get these OSS reports being declassified. You can understand that the ICRC were, were less than pleased. Um, and they swiftly compiled a rebuttal which is, is quite good, it's, quite, it's a pretty decent report um, refuting the OSS's claims. Um, and and what, they, what they said in this, in this report was this, that um, contrary to what OSS had said, um, the people named in the document were volunteers rather than fully-fledged members of the ICRC, which is correct. Um, so that's the first thing OSS got wrong. Indeed, uh, Pagan, the, the key offender here, he had left the ICRC in 1942, that is to say a full year before uh, he was arrested for passing information to the Germans. Based on the decision by the French to release him after interrogation, uh, the committee also concluded that uh, Graz was um, not an asset of German intelligence and he had simply been, the word they used was imprudent in his handling of sensitive information. Um, there's of course no hint in the ICRC report that he might have been a double agent. They don't touch that. Um, but they, they do say that the, he, he was just uh, basically someone who, who uh, spoke a bit too much. One of the other men implicated in Pagan's supposed spiring uh, an ICRC volunteer named Jean Sablé, he was found guilty of having been only less than impartial in his efforts to help a French collaborator avoid uh, the firing squad. Um, uh, he was he collaborated with the Germans. Um, I read that to be him just being a humanitarian and trying to stop someone getting executed. Basically, um, the problem was, of course, that he was overstepping the mark. He was he was telling the military what to do, which you can't do when you're an ICRC delegate. And the ICRC felt similarly, and they dismissed him after this incident uh, in uh, November 1944. So that's he's pretty cut and dry, I think, Sable. All in all. The ICRC's findings concluded that, with the exception of Pagan and Beretta, the indiscretions of the accused ICRC workers were either minor or non-existent, and many of the accusations were based on no more, and I quote here, the OSS's total and complete ignorance of our organisation's role and work. So, yeah, they, they weren't happy. Um, they, they were, you know, very. it's a very defensive document, but um, having gone through the ICRC's files myself and sort of back look at, looked at what they claimed, it, it seems to be on the money. So, with all that said, um, the, the OSS or the ICRC, who, who was right? If one considers the basic number of mistakes in the OSS reports, uh, and indeed the information, the sources of their information, which was mainly human intelligence taken from uh, soldiers on the ground. Um, and the, and the, the reporting in those reports is, is um, uh, not, particularly, um, not particularly good. I think there is little reason to doubt that the committee's conclusion that ignorance was a, a key factor in shaping American suspicions um, is, is pretty near to the truth. 
This ignorance appears to have in part developed from the fact that North Africa was the first theater of the Second World War in which American soldiers experienced this quite peculiar sight, familiar now to the British and the French and the Germans of these ever so polite Swiss gentlemen with the Red Cross armbands asking as if they had some God-given right to speak to prisoners. Um, American soldiers were, were briefed about the Geneva Convention, of course, but I sincerely doubt many of them had read it cover to cover. Um, also, uh, the many handbooks, and there were a number of handbooks issued to the, the forces being uh, deployed in operation in, uh, for the torch landings and, and operations after that. Um, there's, there's little to nothing there explicitly about the ICRC, how to handle them. And there doesn't appear to be from the files any kind of directives from on high to, to the soldiers on the ground saying, you know, look out for these guys, this is what they do, just let them do their thing. Instead, as I said before, they got directives saying be suspicious of these people. Um, there, there are spies in the region. Um, the very fact, therefore, that ICRC delegates maintained regular contact with German consular officials in order to relay information on the condition of Axis prisoners, that perplexed the OS greatly. And it's there in the reports. They don't seem to understand why this is happening. Um, because they worked from the erroneous premise that, and I quote, the Germans gain little from the humanitarian side of ICRC activities. The Germans must be getting some compensatory advantages. So basically they didn't understand what the ICRC was. They thought it was an allied organization there for allied interests. How is it, how is it that it's helping the Germans as well? That didn't compute. Um, for this reason, Routine discussions on board uh, Red Cross ships which docked at Lisbon, the POW supply ships, um, discussions there between the ICRC's delegate and their agent on board, these were interpreted by OSS as an exchange of shipping intelligence between Red Cross workers and pro-Nazi uh, Portuguese who were known to uh, hang around the docks. Um, so there's a grain of truth there, but nonetheless that was, that was the conclusion they, draw, they drew. The deployment of an ICRC delegate to Cairo in, in mid-1942, he was sent there specifically from Geneva for the purposes of pleading the case to visiting uh, Soviet officials, uh, asking them for the umpteenth time, can we establish a delegation in Moscow, which of course went nowhere. Um, this was viewed by OSS as a possible attempt by the committee to snoop on the Cairo conference, uh, where Roosevelt and Churchill were meeting to discuss grand strategy. Finally, Paul Burkhard, a junior ICRC volunteer recruited um, from Ticeno to work in, in Naples. He was suspected of passing information to the Germans, and yet he was confused in the OSS reports with the ICRC's vice president, Carl J. Burke Hart, on which basis the Americans concluded that the ICRC had been, and I quote, infiltrated by the enemy at the highest levels of its leadership. So, pretty grand stuff. Um, and you can, as you can imagine, if they've already decided that the, the, the vice president is, is working for the Nazis, then surely the whole thing is rotten to the core. And it seems to have snowballed from there. And these more outlandish accusations had little basis in reality. However, the very fact that this investigation was launched indicates that for the Americans, the ICRC delegate was pretty much from the first moment they encountered them regarded as, as uh, something to be uh, suspicious of. Um, someone who might actually be willing to work to the detriment of allied interests. Now, in this respect, the, the Americans were not alone in their suspicions, as I said before, but to be more specific about this, the head of Britain's wartime POW department, uh, George Warner, who was a former uh, um, uh, he was ambassador um, in, in Bern, he held to the, the belief uh, that the committee was not only susceptible to manipulation, but was possibly inclined to deliberately favour non-British, specifically German, interests. Um, he didn't much care for the ICRC, thought they were quite naive and amateur. Um, so the, that was a part of the reason he drew this. But the main reason he, he thought that this was the case was because he knew Carl J. Burkhardt. He knew him from before the war. Um, and, and I mentioned Burkhardt, and I wrote an article about this a few years back now, about Burkhardt, um, as a... As a if there's, if there's someone in the ICRC to be suspicious of and who, is, who would have deserved this kind of scrutiny, it is, it is Carl J. Burkhardt. Um, I mean, he was, he was uh, known to be uh, anti-British, didn't like the British, didn't like the Americans, uh, pro-German, uh, vehemently anti-communist, um, and pro-peace. In fact, he'd been involved, whilst being an apolitical 
humanitarian, he'd been involved in peace negotiations, uh, and indeed he was involved in the periphery on, in the negotiations leading up to Rudolf Hess's flight to uh, Scotland in May 1941. Um, moreover, he was um, a long-time friend, old friend uh, of Baron Ernst von Weisseker, who was uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop's deputy. He's also very chummy with Wolfgang Kral, the uh, German consul in Geneva. Now, these connections were known to the British, um, uh, and they indeed in 1942, the MI6 followed him all the way to, to London because they were convinced that he was bringing peace proposals um, via the Swiss Federal Council. Um, doesn't appear to have been, but I mean, who knows? Who knows with Burkhardt? Um, but the fact is that because of, there was already this idea in, in Britain uh, that had been there before the war, in fact, this, this very uh, suspicious uh, feeling towards Burkhardt, um, the fact that his name, albeit misspelled, turns up in the OSS report suggests to me uh, that his name had been passed on by the British. And it, it's possible that this is where it all started, that they said, there's this guy, Burkhardt, da 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 And then they, they saw the volunteer and... I don't know, they left the T off when they were transcribing it or a telegram got mangled or something. They presumed it was the same person and off they went. It's, it's hard to really tell. Um, but at the very least, I, I think there was some dialogue there between the British and the Americans in these concerns. In summary, I want to make two points. Firstly, I don't think there was any pervasive security th threat posed by the ICRC or any Red Cross volunteers during the Second World War. Um, there were indiscretions, yes, and moments of extraordinary naivety in the way the Red Cross carried out its relief work, particularly in Nazi-occupied Europe. But I, I don't think that... Um, I, I think what's more astonishing than, than the idea that the, the Red Cross might have uh, engaged in, in espionage is the fact that they did maintain their neutrality really quite extraordinarily well in these, in these rather um, extreme circumstances, particularly in the, when, in the Far East. Um, for an organisation that had at its bedrock the importance of neutrality and impartiality, there really was no alternative but for it to sit back and occasionally do things like allow requisitions to take place, which um, were, were always going to annoy the, the British. But really, they didn't have a choice in the matter there. All of this, I think, was necessary for the ICRC to carry out its work. The second point I want to make, and this is just a general point about intelligence, um, is that the real lesson in the OSS reports uh, is the problem of intelligence assessments being made without a firm grasp of context. Um, the OSS knew nothing about the Red Cross as a movement, nor next to nothing. Um, they knew next to nothing about the ICRC. Uh, the intelligence cycle going from raw intelligence collected in the field going through the analysis was faulty uh, for the OSS. Uh, and they presumed, for example, as late as December 1944, that the American Red Cross was the same as the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and indeed, I had a similar experience myself um, uh, two years ago when I was in the Washington archives, and I had to spend about 10 minutes arguing with the archivist when I said, I want to see ICRC stuff. He said, oh, American Red Cross. I was like, no, 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 they're two different things. And I had to have this, I, it, was, it was actually near to a full-blown argument with him to, to convince him that no, 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 they are two different organizations. Organizations, um, and so at the time, because the American Red Cross was tied to the American military, obviously that's that's where this idea that the ICRC should be servicing the Allies only—that's uh, likely where it came from. And this basic misconception, I think, lay at the foundation of American suspicions. Um, the actual indiscretions committed by Beretta and Pagan and the like. They were really quite inconsequential to the operation of the ICRC's wartime mission as a whole. As I say, I think it's, it's the more astonishing thing is how well the ICRC maintained its neutrality um, in, in the face of uh, some pretty extraordinary circumstances. The British were on slightly firmer ground in their assessment of Karl Burkhardt. Um, there's still a few question marks hanging over him. And the British also, in terms of their wariness over the ICRC's pursuit of, of uh, humanitarian aid, humanitarian relief at all costs, their grievance with the ICRC for that being disruptive to uh, their strategy. I think they had some grounds to be annoyed there, but there's a difference between having some grounds to be annoyed and suspecting them of working for the Germans. Um, and as I say, most, most British officials understood that distinction. Some took it a little too far. Um, in conclusion, distrust, misapprehension, and that fundamental clash of ideals between humanitarian motives as opposed to operational and strategic concerns, 
these were the key factors in explaining this um this quite unusual episode in uh, allied red cross relations and i think i'll leave it at that thank you Um, oh uh, yes, yes. Um, I've I've only looked at a, a few uh, files, to be honest. Um, it's a bit it's a bit messy, um, but there's there's really not. Um, I, I've I've spoken to people who who know the German side far better than I do, um, and they, they've they've confirmed that there's really not not anything not anything substantial there. Again, there's there's always little hints in these things, um, as there were hints in this particularly about George Graz, but they're, they're nothing more substantial, really. Yeah. 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 Sort of along those lines, I was wondering, um, a lot of talk about double agents you mentioned a few times, mm -hmm. um, a lot of paranoia, neutral zones, a lot of personalities and anecdotes and things of that sort. Um, I was wondering if, if all this sort of paranoia and hysteria about this humanitarian organisation being international across war zones mm -hmm. as a venue for spies of our enemies, was there any notion that perhaps might be a venue for our boys to go into to Germany? Well, as I say, they, they'd, they'd already, they'd already uh, had, had a go at that. Um, but they, again, uh, not having looked at uh, certain files that are still declassified, I couldn't tell you for certain. Um, but, but that's, that's I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. Well, yeah, um, absolutely. We saw a few weeks ago, we might have seen in the papers, that I think it's the Home Office has sort of hoarded all these kind of Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 so yes. Do you yes, suffer yes. from a lack of source materials? Well, the the people because MI five ran intelligence in um in the British colonies and in Britain itself. Um, if it's if it's operations uh, overseas, it's MI six, and those files are uh, off limits to the likes of myself, um, uh, or the special operations executive. And I, I've been through a lot of SOE files, and um, there are times when the Red Cross is mentioned, um, but there's nothing there to suggest that they were ever used um at least at least not the red cross itself the red cross emblem was there was there was a big debate in uh, i think it was in 1940 between mi9 who were the people in charge of uh organizing escapes from pow camps and they said to the british red cross um or was it i think the no they said to the war office they said look what we want to do is we want to make up dummy parcels and send hacksaws and things through it and and they said well, well that's that's a nice idea but the problem is that if the germans discover that then they will stop all red cross parcels going to the camps and our pow's will be in in a lot of bother um and and it was a it was quite a back and forth debate and and eventually um uh, mi9 lost that debate um so that didn't happen but still as as late as when 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 they were um during the invasion of italy and there was the uh, there was a big problem with the evacuation of POWs um, during the liberation there, um, and and Italy's surrender. There was that discussion was raised again, saying <coughs> we should really be using the Red Cross here, and it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. I mean, I, I might have uh, given the impression to the contrary, but I mean, the lion's share of British officials really did understand the importance of the Red Cross's neutrality. They, 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 and they, they did. And, and, that, and that, to me, as I say, I find quite extraordinary, given how, uh, particularly in 1940, how, how sort of you know, desperate things were or seemed. Um, and, and the same is true, I mean, as I say, for the most part, from what I can gather from the, from the German side, they did tend to understand that if, you, if, if, the, if the Red Cross is somehow impeded, um, then prisoners of war will suffer. And particularly for the British, I mean, they already had a scandal when, when parcels didn't get through in 1940. There was a big public backlash. So if, if there was something, if they did something that endangered POWs overseas, there would have been a hell to pay domestically. Um, so I, I, think, I think they were wary of using the Red Cross for that purpose. There's a whole generation of people on both sides who had come into contact with the Red Cross during the First World War. Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, you know, they exactly. knew how they knew, they knew, it they knew right? the, yeah. the the yeah they knew the basics of it. And and it's interesting you say that because I mean they they did they knew the basics, but this was the the one of the things that really came out uh, as I was going through the the research for the book, and and particularly when you get into 1942. The, the British officials were like, yes, well, this is what the Red Cross did in the First World War, and that's what they're going to do in this war. And it's like, well, no, this is a different war, and they need to do more, and they're going to need ships. I mean, there was all kinds of back and forth over the negotiations to actually get Red Cross ships on the high seas. That was uh, something that the Ministry of War Transport were 
absolutely against the Admiralty hated it. Um, it was um, because, again, they, they had probably grown up with that or had experience with that First World War idea um, of a more limited response, not this global fleet that, they, that the ICRC wanted, not um, delegations in far-flung places. So where was all the, the, the material coming from? Was it, I mean, where were they getting this? Because they weren't getting food in Europe, were they? Because everybody was starving. Oh, uh, the, the, well, they, the... Are they buying it in South America or something? Uh, they are... Yeah. It was coming from all kinds of places. There were there were donors. I mean, a lot of the Greek war relief that was create, uh, gathered by a Greek um, uh, war relief board or something. I think they were called in Washington. I think they were, um, and they were taking donations from across the United States. Um, and they also they sourced material. That they they came up with this loophole, which is quite clever, I think, where they they said to um, and this was Burkhart, who's quite savvy. He said to the British. Um, Look, what we'll do is we'll we'll buy stuff from uh, within. Sorry, well, yeah. Hang on, let me remember how this works. Yes, we'll, we'll buy uh, wheat from Turkey, which the uh, the Germans want, and we'll use that to send to Greece. And that way, and this is how he framed it to them. He said, "We're actually denying the Germans this stuff," you know. So he was, he was very clever. Um, and they bought it. They said, "Yeah, all right, we can we can do that. We can work around that." Um, He's one of the few who seem to have been politically savvy enough to, to sort of speak Whitehall's language in that respect. Most of the rest of them just said, no, we need everything. <laughs> just send it all in. Um, they had ships that were all painted up. Again. Yes, the, the white the ships. Yeah, um, yeah well, there, there are a couple. Actually, I mean, in, in 1944, it, things got really tense because in the lead up to uh, D-Day, uh, they lost, I think, three ships... Uh, off the coast of France, there were, and uh, two of them at least were were sunk by British warplanes, um, uh, and and they and Red Cross uh, ICRC delegates lost their lives on board those ships. They they went down with the ships, um, and, and uh, a chap, um, uh, the Sturborg, that was the name of the ship, that was sunk by the Italians um, in the Adriatic, I think, in '42, and they lost an ICRC delegate there as well. So I think they lost. In total, three or four ships to direct Allied action. Uh, not to mention the ambulances and so forth that got strafed at various times um, in in forty four. The the Italians seem to have done it on purpose. <laughs> well, they they did it in Ethiopia in thirty five. Yeah. So I, I think I think they might have they might have just continued with it. Yeah. I, I was just a couple of observations, and the, yeah. I, it doesn't surprise me the, the, the sort of misinterpretation put on the activities by intelligence services mm. because first of all intelligence services are trained to be suspicious mm -hmm. secondly it's actually in their interest to find suspicious people not to not find them yes which is why they tend to do it in um, organizations today mm -hmm. and they also completely don't understand voluntary organizations and scientists no which is probably why they got into such a mess over here with Things like animal and environmental charities mm -hmm. and people crazy, yeah. Um, then, from from um, comparisons with the First World War, I don't know that much about the the ICRC during, during mm -hmm. the First World War, but there was certainly that the ICRC delegates that were inspecting POW camps in in the UK during the First World War, the, the British authorities didn't like them at all. No, of course they they thought they were meddling. Yes, um, and. Uh, you know, and also, it was absolutely fine for, for, for them to be inspecting the camps in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. not over here. Um, and I'm not aware that there's certainly, there's certainly nothing outside intelligence files that suggests that they, they suspected ICRC members during the First World War of um, spying activities. But there were certainly some incidents with national Red Cross. In, in, Mainly main yes. the Australians at yes. the start of the war. Yes. The, 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 um, uh, the, the British military were arresting Australian Red Cross men mm. all over the place. Because they, with reason? Well, <laughs> the, the main, yeah, well, with reason in a sense, because the, the Australian Red Cross decided to send um, their, their officials to the front mm. without getting it cleared through the British military authorities. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, and, and so they, there were these people wandering around. It's like the Boer War basically. all over again. It's similar. Uh, that were getting arrested. Mm. So they, they sort of sorted, 
sorted all that out. But as far as I know, I thought the very interesting thing was the way in which the Economic Warfare Committee mm. um, uh, thought of them. Because, and, and again, I don't know enough about the Committee for Relief in Belgium, Hoover's. Mm -hmm. I know that they, they were trying to place agents mm -hmm. in them. But I, I've not read anything about their worries, for example, you know, about the, the Germans then requisitioning what the um, CRB was distributing in Belgium. Because it must have been a, a pretty... Yeah. In fact, in, in a way, probably... It would have been more, more dire. Largely, it, yeah. It was during the Second World War. Yeah, that's, that's true, actually. I, I can't say I know myself um, about that. I would, I would think yes. <laughs> we, it, it, I just a, a, a guess would be yes. Um, the requisitioning seems to have been uh, pretty institutionalised, um, so I'm guessing it had a prehistory. I mean, I mean, Hitler gave them orders to, to live off the land, and that, of course, didn't, uh, didn't help matters, but I'm guessing there would have been a, a previous... Mm -hmm. uh, that must have happened beforehand, I would think. Yeah. 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 Um, it seems to me that a lot of what occurred in the First World War basically happened in the Second World War the same, it just uh, there were you know, little variations on it. Um, the, the camp inspectors in Britain in the, first, in the Second World War were slightly more welcome. Um, than than what you suggest, I, I wasn't aware of that about about the First World War, uh, about them being hostile to them. But um, they that seems to have been uh, again, it's it's that changed that the the one the main thing that makes the difference. Uh, I mean, there are lots of things that make the difference, but the main thing that makes the difference between the First World War and the Second World War experience for how the Red Cross is treated is the fact that uh, the loss of the British Expeditionary Force and the defeat of France. That, that is, after that, things change. Um, um, and they become both far more friendly with the inspectors because they've got 44,000 uh, POWs in, in the Reich now and, and, and a big scandal brewing at home. So all of a sudden, they're very, uh, very happy to let uh, the ICRC do whatever they want in, in the British Isles so that they can get reciprocal in, in the Reich. But... Um, at the same time, you have, and that's the political, uh, sorry, the um, uh, prisoner of war department at the Foreign Office, and and the department directorate for prisoners of war at the War Office. But then at the same time, you have the Ministry of Economic Warfare saying, well, no, this lot have to be stopped because they want, they want to ruin our blockade and da da da. So, there, I mean, there are these fights in between. I mean, generally speaking, the the Foreign Office. I mean, Anthony Eden, he seems to have been pro. Uh, ICRC because he realised what a scandal it was the the the, the publicity the bad publicity about the starving Greeks for example uh, he was a he was one of the few people in Whitehall saying well actually we should let them do this just for the uh, pointing out of course that we want Greece as a sphere of influence after the war and we should do right by it now and all the rest um, but a lot of the rest of them are a bit more short sighted I think in in that in that view it didn't ruin the blockade. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> well, no. I mean, I mean, uh, the the uh, the the Third Reich managed to. Uh, I mean, even this was the, the crazy thing about all this is that a lot of the conclusions made drawn by the Ministry of Economic Warfare about the importance of the blockade were based on very faulty intelligence. The Germans had already figured out how to out 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 uh, maneuver the blockade before they even invaded France, really. So, yeah, it's all. All a bit of a mess. Well, thanks, I've got, I, thanks so much for your interesting talk. I've been working on MI5's activities in Algiers only today. Oh, yes. So I've got some specific points to ask you. You mentioned mm. whether it was kind of North Africa was kind of a nest of spies. Mm. And I've been familiar with all these OSS reports, all the misinformation and the spelling mistakes, <laughs> the rumours and the lies that go into them become truth. And then I was revisiting Christopher Andrews' book, Defence of the Realm. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, according to his book, I mean, there were 250 out there MI5 double agents alone. Yes. And then we think about the nexus of Dizzy uh, and uh, mm -hmm. NKVD, OSS. There seemed to have been a lot of spies. Oh, they, oh, they were. <laughs> they were. I mean, I mean, the, the, the North Africa is a, as a nest of spies. That's correct. Yeah. Like, that, that was a correct, you know, basis. And, and that, well, that was my first question. My second one was... Um, I'm sure you, you discovered you're going to be onto these weird organisations. I ended up having to research the French Christian Science Church as to whether it was supposedly okay. an allied infiltration network because the Germans had shut it down in Germany and they were trying to ally with the French Protestant Church. Mm. Kind of rubbish. Anyway, um, I was just wondering if you know that book Americans in Paris by Charles Glass. 
because he discusses the American hospital in Paris, and I was just—I don't know anything about this. So I was just wondering if that how the how that fits in with the whole humanitarian. I I don't think I've read that. No, it's not really oh, yeah, about. It's it just it's okay. interesting for the similar issues as you raised about the. Oh, what was what was the premise of it? The, the sorry, the, this book. The book oh, so it was I think it was two or three hundred Americans were left behind in Paris after. Paris fell to the Germans and then the US entered the war. Okay. And he was looking at what they were doing and they were running libraries and oh, I see, I how see. they negotiated with the occupying forces and so on. Yeah, yeah. And there was a hospital. Neutrals at that time in there, yeah, yeah. 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 Class Cupid <coughs> about the neutral states mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean like Portugal, yes. Spain, yes. Turkey, ostensibly Egypt, yeah. even though it was occupied. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that attracted more, well, I'm sure it had more spies. Oh yes, uh, the 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 spy capital of of the world, basically, uh, with the exception perhaps of, of Switzerland, was uh, Portugal in, in the second world. Lisbon was was uh, ground zero for spies. Madrid as well. Um, I mean, these these were absolute hotbeds. Um, and after the front opened in North, Af North Africa, I mean, after the American invasion in North Africa, obviously those networks became more active because it's right on their doorstep and it, and it sort of uh, went out from there. So the idea that the, the Mediterranean theatre in general uh, was very spy heavy is absolutely correct. Very spy heavy. And then the neutral states in particular, for obvious reasons, were, um, uh, yeah, just spies field day, basically. Were, were these neutral states sort of involved in the Red Cross, was there a um, connection between spying well, and the neutral states and the Red Cross elsewhere? Not there? entirely certain, to be honest. Um, I mean, the, 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 the only one that I can really think of is the Lisbon connection, because at Lisbon you have, um, you have one of the main uh, open ports into Europe. Uh, a lot of shipping go went through there. You have uh, the Red Cross, the British Red Cross had a number of warehouses there. The ICRC had delegations there. It was the main stopping point for their fleet, for the supply fleet. Um, and then you have an awful lot of spies as well. So the idea that there may have been some sort of crossover there uh, is likely. Um, but I, I think if, if anything happened in these regions, it would have been quite low level. Um, things like the odd, as was assumed in the OSS report, that, that, that you might have had pro-Nazi Portuguese who, who were like, oh, there's this ship coming, and that's going, and we've heard that it's going to this port, and that it's got X amount of supplies on it, and you should be the, you should have troops there to requisition those supplies, and that sort of thing. That probably did happen. Um, but, again, there's no, there's no evidence for that. That's just a hunch. And in Spain, over the Pyrenees, there was the secret routes. Yes, yes, France, yes, or, yes. Or Vichy France. From Vichy, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there are all kinds of, of ways that, that things could have, uh, that the Red Cross, for example, could have been abused in those areas, but it, uh, I only can guess, <laughs> to be honest, uh, apart, from, apart from what I know about Lisbon specifically. Um, you, you did touch on the uh, um, Red Cross and the concentration camps. Issue. Yes. In your uh, work, have you picked up anything about Kachin? Oh yes, I've got a whole section on that. Um, they handled Kachin very well, strangely enough. Um, it was... Uh, well, the Germans were clearly uh, helpful. <laughs> well, what what basically happened was that the, the they were were asked, of course, to, to go and inspect, and that was Goebbels' propaganda wanted the wanted the ICRC there to give validation, and it was the Polish Red Cross uh, person who they originally got, uh, whose name escapes me now, who who said, no, this is a propaganda nonsense. I'm not going to say, um, uh, you know, da da da. Um, and, and they stayed away from it. And the ICRC were, the ICRC were actually investigated at this point by the uh, political warfare executive in, in, in Britain. They compiled a report on, uh, for, for, for uh, the war cabinet, it was basically the report was, what are the ICRC going to do about Katyn and, and how should we respond to that? And their report concluded, well, they're going to do nothing about it. And 
to their credit, they didn't. They they sent the the ICRC sent this incredibly well worded uh, memorandum to uh, Berlin, uh, to Moscow, and and to London, I think. And it said, um, I'm trying to remember how it was phrased. It was it said that um, we could only uh, involve ourselves in this investigation if we can guarantee that there are two witnesses to each of these murders. Um, and we are more than willing to, to investigate this um, on this proviso um, and, and with the agreement of all parties concerned. And they, and they phrased it like that because they knew damn well that Moscow would not consent to them investigating it. And they knew also that there was no way to find two witnesses for each murder. So they, they gave themselves an out, basically. Um, whilst at the same time putting forward this message saying, of course we are, you know, this is a, this is a war crime. We are more than willing to, to look into it and, and da, 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 da. But they, their, their internal minutes are, are fascinating because they basically look at it and go, this is way too messy. We, we don't want anything to do with this. Um, which I, th I think, to be fair to them, was probably the right thing because there was, there was no win for them in that. If they'd have gone into that, they would have discredited themselves uh, with the Germans. Uh, because, well, depending on what they said, um, they would have upset what was going on in Britain with uh, the the, uh, uh, the Russians and the, and the Poles and the, the diplomatic break that they had over that. Um, and they would have somehow managed to annoy the Russians even more than they already had. Um, so they, they basically... This was coming... Katyn occurred off the back of the, um, the shackling crisis, uh, the shackling of POWs that the ICRC was involved in. And that involved a lot of politicking. So I think they were a bit, um, by that stage, they were a bit, um, they were ready for a rest from, from high politics. That's the general flavour of their minutes on the subject of Katy, and they sort of say, well, this is, this is too hard. And again, this is Burkhardt leading this charge, saying it's, it's too hard, we should stay out of it. So they played a very political game with it, basically, to their own benefit. Have you encountered any evidence, I mean, just in passing, about the same sorts of uh, suspicions, not, not just of the Red Cross, but of other, I suppose, voluntary organisations, say, say in, in Britain or even in Australia, where they were trying to take a humanitarian line. I, I mean, I, all I can recall is reading Bureau of Britain and how the people, the campaign that they had, church-based campaign mm. against uh, carpet bombing. They were all being investigated. Yeah. By intelligence. I mean, so in a sense. I, yeah. Well, the, the pacifist organisations, they were all monitored um, yeah. in, in the UK. Um, and then I'm sure some of those crossed over with these humanitarian mm. agent, uh, groups. Um, specifically, the only one that I know of is, and it was a justifiable one, it was a, it was a, 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 a Nazi humanitarian organisation. Mm -hmm. Um, whose name escapes me now. It had, a, it had a very long name, very sort of hyperbole, and and they uh, they were operating in France, and they were basically a front to requisition supplies, um, and uh, the the Red Cross uh, were the the French Red Cross had had I think sent them supplies or, or something. They they basically said, "Oh, you're you're humanitarians, have our stuff," and then they went and, and took it to to Hitler's granary. And the um that that was uh, obviously something that, that got back to London and raised eyebrows. But um that's the only one I can I can think of off the top of my head. Um, does the international dimension and gets very sensitive politically pose uh, complications for your search for these files? Uh, because of course, as you mentioned, to either confirm these stories, you need to go to German archives, which means a different language. Yeah. And again, could have been weeded, as we've seen. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 the, I mean the. The ICRC, well, the Red Cross and Swiss sources I've looked at, they're in German and French, so I've already sort of crossed that Rubicon. But um, uh, the, it, I mean, it does get messy, definitely. Um, and that's part of the reason why my focus, I wanted to keep it on Britain for that reason. And, and also for the fact that a lot of the work on the Red Cross um, has really been done focusing on on its struggles with belligerents who didn't tolerate it at all uh japan uh, germany the soviet union that's that's where the i guess the more sensationalist stories are and so i wanted to see how you know a, a western liberal democratic government espoused these humanitarian values actually worked with this organization at a time when it was conducting total war or near to total war um and and it i mean it presents intricacies that and there is that international dimension, as you say, but the story just of of Britain itself, 
and and you have to bring Switzerland into this as well, the Swiss Federal Council and their 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 attitude because they're backing the the Red Cross, the ICRC through all of this. Um, that brings in that dimension. But to be honest, the the German side of things with the Red Cross uh, has been pretty well done, I think, um, generally speaking. Um, so it's I mean I I toyed at one point with you know just going absolutely mad with it and just sort of <laughs> looking at, at everything and, and and at which point it becomes a history of the ICRC in the Second World War um, which I, I wasn't game to write <laughs> is it, why are there is it still so sensitive that they won't open the documents it's 70 years ago now well, yeah, but it's there. I mean it's, it's no it's, I mean it's the, you can imagine how popular I was when, when I got yeah, to Geneva. Yeah. I'd like to see your OSS stuff and I'd like to see the uh, Holocaust stuff, please. And, um, yeah, um, but no, no, actually, to their credit, the archivists there are actually um, quite um, quite helpful um, once, you, once you get into that. Um, uh, it's uh, for the same reasons. I mean, these same principles that, that uh, dictate how the ICRC works today, the neutrality, the impartiality, mm -hmm. that the... They're still as important today as they always were, and I think it, you know you don't want to bring skeletons out of the closet. No. Don't I? I think that's that's mainly it. But they are quite. I mean, their Holocaust stuff now. I mean, that's all out there, so you can you can go to Geneva and you can say, "Show me your Holocaust stuff," and they say, "Fine." Um, they usually want to know why you're looking at it, mm -hmm. but you know that's their right to ask, I guess. Um, but they're they're not. Uh, then I don't think they're as bad as they used to be. Talking to colleagues um, mm. who, who researched, who worked in their archives uh, before I even started my undergraduate, um, I think it was, particularly in the 90s, it was quite, obviously mm. quite sensitive. It gets better with each passing year, I suspect. <laughs> Have you been tailed by any gentlemen wearing hats? Oh, not that I've noticed. Anybody else have sort of following you around? No, no. No, not as yet, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well, exactly. If they do the job right, I wouldn't know, would I? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's. I, I don't. I don't think that the the uh, this uh, OSS stuff was for me very. Um, it was just an interesting thing because it harmonised the two things that I'm interested in: the intelligence history and the humanitarian history, and and um, it was just an interesting little. Uh, chapter in this in this very up and down relationship between the i mean not just the british government but the allied government's relationship with the because i mean by the end of the war when it gets to 1945 and they're discussing who's actually going in to set up the relief they'd already got these plans in place for the british red cross and the american red cross and UNRWA, of course but the, the british are saying under no circumstances should the icrc be allowed to do any stuff and the americans are saying why not let them in. So they'd suddenly, I guess, because by this stage the war was won, obviously. So if there if there were if there were any lingering suspicions from what happened in North Africa, they seem to have gone by by uh, the, the time of D Day because they're saying, well, actually, and and it's funny because throughout the war the, the ICRC sort of struggled to get genuine cooperation from Britain, uh, fully the, to the level that they wanted. They got cooperation, but not to the level they wanted. But in the final months of the war, it was uh, the Supreme uh, Allied Expeditionary Force under Eisenhower that actually gave them incredible assistance, a lot of assistance. And we're like, yep, whatever you want. You want trucks? Have trucks. You want you want fuel, tyres, all the rest. <coughs> um, so it is, it, it's very up and down relationship. One final yeah. question, if I may. What about the papacy? I don't know a thing about that. Not touching that. <laughs> That's for someone braver than I. Um, I mean, there, there's obviously been a few things written uh, about about that, um, but I can't say I've read them, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Actually, independent for dealing fascist Italy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, there's, I mean, there's been uh, there's been a lot of a lot of stuff on that for and against, uh, from what I can gather, some defending the popes and against it, um, but I. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.